that. So I think we'll move on to the, uh, the next talk. And uh, I introduced uh, Dave on uh, Monday, so you're familiar with his uh, background and his range of interests. And so I think I'll just invite Dave to continue on with the next presentation. All right, hello everybody. I um, hope you can hear me and um, see the screen. And uh, so I'm going to talk for a while about uh, uncertainties and best practices in phase equilibrium modeling and thermogrammetry. Um, if you can see it and it's not concealed, there's a little sort of outline along the bottom. I'm going to talk about sources of uncertainty, um, their relevance to phase diagrams, um, uncertainty in assemblages, um, and uh, uncertainty in PT calculations, and that'll bring in the average PT method. And then the last section of the presentation will be a relatively quick um, run through the, the, the best practices. Um, okay, here we do have a second slide. Let me find a pointer. Um, yeah, Dave's already mentioned some of the things that we're going to cover. Um, and, and so this, this, um, this, this session kind of introduces some of the things that uh, will be covered in other people's talks. Um, and uh, mainly I'm going to be talking about uncertainties um, and uh, as I said, some, some thoughts on and some examples of best practice. There'll be a little on belt compositions here. There'll be much more detail in Pierre Lenari's talk that um, follows on uh, later today. Uh, the focus I'm going to apply really is on uncertainty in practical applications of, uh, of thermobarometry. Um, and um, uh, so when I talk about uncertainty, it will not relate to the departures from equilibrium that um, um, Dave Patterson is going to talk about um, uh, tomorrow, um, unless I specifically say so. Um, so I'm, for the most part, I'm going to be assuming that equilibrium behavior um, and uh, uh, assume that the rocks are in equilibrium and deal with the uncertainty on the other factors that result um, from the data sets, the solution models, analytical uncertainty, sampling bias, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so, and, and mainly I'm going to assume that we're interested in, in doing thermobarometry with phase diagrams or with average PT. So, um, among the aspects of uncertainty we need to consider, are whether uncertainties are random or systematic. And um, we've got some sort of conventional diagrams here that will uh, illustrate that concept um, just to make sure everybody's familiar with it. Um, if the uncertainties in the particular um, parts of our system or particular properties are random, that means they can be treatable by standard error propagation techniques. And, um, um, you know, they're uh, eff effectively given normal distribution or they're, um, or, or they're Gaussian. Um, um, and uh, systematic error, on the other hand, systematic uncertainty, is when we um, find that our calculated result is biased to one side or other of uh, what we believe to be the true value um, for various reasons. Um, could be an inaccurate experimental value, we could be combining incompatible data, things like that. Um, Another aspect we might want to consider is whether our uh, individual uncertainties are independent of each other or whether they're correlated in some way. And of course, the um, enthalpies in um, data sets are likely to be correlated. And in the Holland and Powell data sets, they've been regressed by least squares. Um, so whereas an individual value uh, for an enthalpy um, may, be, uh, may, may have roughly um, uh, Gaussian um, normal error distribution, uh, as a set, they're highly correlated, and the um, covariance matrix, for example, is an integral part of the data set as a whole. There's a discussion of that in Powell and Hall in 1993. Uh, it's fair to say that combining and propagating uncertainties from different sources is not simple, and there'll be a couple of slides later that um, um, show how they uh, combine or don't combine together. Um, so all this is actually going to be rather qualitative. I'm not going to present you know, anything really in the way of formulate or detailed statistical models. And I, I guess it'll become evident that the kinds of uncertainty that we're examining you know, don't really warrant that sort of treatment anyway. And uh, later I'll even have to blur the random versus systematic distinction slightly just to make, uh, just to make a point. Um, so on the diagrams on the right, if you, um, um, you, know, if you, if you want to kind of analyze them, um, 
accuracy versus precision, um, we're assuming that there's a, a value of some parameter which we're trying to um, uh, reproduce or model um, is some exact value. And, uh, but there could be differences in the precision or the accuracy of our attempts to, uh, um, to locate it. So uh, uh, top left, we have uh, an estimate of ours that's both precise and accurate. It's within one standard deviation. To its right, we have one which is inaccurate because it's um, outside two or even three standard deviations. Um, our estimates might be imprecise, but they can still be accurate because this one is still within one standard deviation of our um, attempt to calculate it. And on the right here, we have one which is imprecise. It's not very accurate, but I've actually drawn that at the uh, two sigma, at the two sigma limit. <clears throat> okay, I've put this in. Uh, this is actually 25 years old, what's on this page. Um, so it's a view of uncertainty, which um, was, um, you could argue, more relevant to when we're using an individual thermometer and individual barometer. Um, but in practice, the, uh, the, the types of uncertainty haven't really changed. We still have uncertainty on the thermometer calibration, although now it would be uncertainties that are built into the data sets we're using. Um, there's still uncertainty in activity composition relationships. And in those days, there weren't very many um, uh, elaborate models for, uh, for, for complicated solutions. And so really the question was, do we use an ideal or non-ideal model? And now we've, uh, far more sophisticated uh, uh, models available now, um, which will still have uncertainty structures of their own. <clears throat> so analytical uncertainty on the mineral analyses, well, that hasn't changed. There's a, um, a, a, a um, there's counting statistics on the microprobe analysis, for example, and there are um, uh, uncertainties in the way the uh, uh, probe was standardized and the correction procedures. And so that, that turns out to be a mixture of treatable random, random errors and systematic errors that might arise from the calibration for that particular session. And then there's something which, um, you know, I, I wrote as geological error here, and actually it ended up in um, a paper by Richard Palin and others um, assessing geological error. Um, and, I, and I wrote it here as um, you know, errors that we might introduce by um, supplying um, non-equilibrium um, uh, mi mineral compositions for, for use in our calculations, but it also applies to sampling uncertainty, and, and we'll look very much at that. Um, another distinction we want to make is uh, between overall uncertainty, which is the sum of everything in that list, and a comparison uncertainty, which concerns our ability to resolve dew pressures or temperatures or whatever, which have been determined using the same calibrations, I will say now, of um, thermobarometric data. Um, it depends largely on the analytical uncertainty and it's likely to be quite a bit smaller, or we hope it'll be quite a bit smaller than the overall uncertainty. And Frank Spear deals with uh, this um, also quite nicely in his um, big blue book from 1993. So um, let's look a bit, uh, let's try to be a bit more specific about some of the uh, sources of uncertainty in our current data sets and models. Um, so looking at fundamental end member data that's derived from experiments and calorimetry and phase equilibrium studies, and they've been regressed and fitted to give us a, 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 an internally consistent um, set of data. Um, when a least squares approach is used, like it is in the Holland and Powell data sets, then um, because what they develop then is a you know, big covariance matrix for all these things that, uh, that allows some quantification and error propagation um, if it was done that way. Um, I've also put there that um, there's you know, potentially input from natural data sets. It's um, not entirely clear how natural data um, contribute to uh, the uncertainty in those. And uh, um, there's doubtless the opportunity for further compilations. And Jacob Forshaw is going to be talking um, uh, tomorrow on, uh, on, on that kind of aspect of the, the role that natural data uh, can play in. in um, in comparing and refining with, uh, with the calculated results. Um, there's a trade-off in solution models, or am I there yet? Solution models, yeah. Um, uh, solution models are of very complexity and they're inevitably simplifications of the real situation. And uh, those who put them together have had to decide what to take into account, so, um, site preferences, ordering and, uh, and such things. Um, and you know, we may be concerned if that they are flexible enough or tolerant enough of the natural variation of samples to handle our real analyses. 
And uh, I think it's fair to say that the models for most complex minerals are still um, uh, very much works in progress. Um, they may have to be made more complicated or they may have to be just rationalized and perhaps even simplified a little um, to be robust for the purposes that we need. Um, they have is that solution parameters, the, in, the interaction parameters, the W's for short. Um, there may be, uh, in some cases, um, considerable uncertainty in those. Um, other cases, there are sort of, you know, mineralogical models that, uh, that constrain them intolerably well. Uh, but um, often because they're not all independent, uh, there's some correlation uh, uh, among those. In solution models, there's some kind of trade-off or compromise between having a simple, efficient, efficient model and one that's more comprehensive but computationally more tricky. Uh, we've touched on that a little bit in some of the talks on the, uh, on, on, on the um, uh, computation methods. Um, right hand side panel here is going to um, focus on uh, the difference between um, types of uncertainty that can be propagated through our calculations and uh, some that can't. Um, so uh, those that can are largely the um, random uncertainties, analytical uncertainty from um, probe counting statistics is, is one example. Um, that regression of thermodynamic properties of end members in databases like the Holland and Powell data sets, um, that's potentially propagatable through our calculations. And the solution model interaction energies also um, uh, can, be, can be propagated to a certain extent. Um, but a lot of the other uncertainties are uh, they're uncertain. We may be able to put some kind of estimate on them, but they're not quantifiable to the extent necessarily where they can be propagated through all our calculations. And that applies to the systematic part of our analytical uncertainty and to the various assumptions that have been made in the way we calculate, we recalculate our mineral formulae and how they're incorporated in the, uh, act, uh, in the um, uh, solution models. And um, something I think that has been raised uh, uh, briefly in earlier talks is if, for example, um, we have uh, end member properties that have not been somehow retrogressed, and that might be entropies or heat capacities, um, then that is some other form of systematic um, uncertainty that we might not have taken into account. So those types broadly correspond to random versus systematic uncertainty. Um, for the second class, if you, uh, if you read um, uh, Roger Powell's papers, you'll find he prefers to use the word bias rather than uncertainty um, to, uh, to I, th I think, to just, just to denote and, and reinforce the idea that these are forcing a value away um, from uh, uh, some desired uh, result. In other words, they're affecting accuracy um, as much or rather more than, uh, than precision. So I've tried to sum all this up and rationalize it um, just so that we can have uh, uh, types of uncertainty that we can refer back to later on um, for, you know, from their sources in, in our calculations and also um, give some sort of little graphic view of, uh, of them that, that might be helpful. So there's data set uncertainty at the top, which is mainly our, our, our enthalpies. Solution model uncertainty in the Holland and Powell um, situation that relates to the um, uh, exios and the fitting of the, uh, of the solution models. Um, some of that is uh, propagatable, um, but uh, you know, inevitably there are decisions made in the formulation of the model that are not quantifiable. Um, I've using the word quantifiable here, um, uh, rather than the strict terms random or Gaussian, um, I think mainly because I'm just, I'm referring to things that you know, could conceivably be estimated and put into a propagation um, rather than that they're necessarily strictly, uh, strictly Gaussian. Um, and and uh, 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 uncertainty and error in solution model formulation, oh, I've already said that, that uh, no, will, will affect accuracy rather than precision. So that, that is going to be something to look out for. Um, Analytical uncertainty of our own, we've uh, covered that. Um, it's uh, if, if you run Tim Holland's AXE program to get activities to put into average PT, you'll find that those uncertainties are estimated for you. Um, sampling or geological uncertainty, there'll be some more to say on that later, but uh, heterogeneity or bias in the, uh, leads, uh, in the assemblages and modes that you're going to, uh, you're going to determine and use free calculations. And so that comes under the heading systematic, not quantifiable. Um, um, so that's in, that, that's in red on, in the graphic on the right. Green on the graphic on the right means quantifiable. Yellow means at least partly quantifiable. 
and red means uh, mostly systematic. Um, down the line from that, we need a composition uncertainty, a belt composition uncertainty, which depends on our input data. And it derives from the analytical and the sampling uncertainty. So some of it's quantifiable and some of it isn't. So it's, uh, so it's yellow in the middle on that diagram. Um, the bit that relates to mineral analyses and activities um, on the right here is what corresponds to our comparison uncertainties. Um, whereas um, overall uncertainty covers pretty much everything else. So that's another um, distinction that from time to time uh, we want to make. Um, so uh, this next slide is entitled On Thermobarometry, which uh, was the title of a paper by uh, Powell and Holland in 2008. And uh, it also emphasizes that uh, much of what we do and therefore what I'm mainly concentrating on is directed at thermobarometry, getting equilibrated PNT conditions or maybe a record of changing PNT conditions and for rocks we're specifically interested in. And yes, as you'll be aware, we've got currently two approaches. Uh, there's an inverse modeling approach, which uh, is often called conventional thermobarometry. And the uh, uh, sort, of, sort of broader manifestation of that is, uh, is in uh, um, uh, no calculated solutions like average PT, where we use compositional data from equilibrated minerals. Um, you know, we're assuming we've got an equilibrated rock uh, or at least an equilibrated subassemblage. Um, and also um, for the forward modeling, we need a, uh, a, a, an effective or a relevant bulk composition. So for the inverse modeling, we use our own compositional data. We determine or um, program calculates for us log K for, um, for, for a equilibria that uh, um, within, that, um, uh, within that system, and it'll find the best fit of those equilibria and pressure and temperature for us. Forward modeling using calculated phase diagrams, we define the chemical system we want to use, which will provide a bulk composition. And then we can go on and we can calculate mineral assemblage fields. We can calculate mineral composition isopleths. Um, we can calculate mineral proportions as volume modes or, or, or in some, uh, some set of molar units. And we can use any or all of these to locate the natural rock in pressure, temperature, and composition space. Um, if you look at the Powell and Holland paper, you'll see that um, there's uh, some key of uh, their key statements I've listed here is that they're very strongly encouraging us to use the rocks belt composition information because it provides additional information on the PT conditions, essentially by constraining the extent of mineral assemblage stability. In other words, use the assemblage fields um, on a calculated diagram because they can be contoured for the mineral compositions and for the mineral proportions. Um, what that means from their point of view is that to be compatible with this approach, if you do conventional th thermobarometry alongside or the inverse modeling, then you should be using the same data set and solution models as you are using for the phase diagram calculations. So if you're using average PT, for example, you should be using the um, equations of state, the, the, the solution models that are um, part of the, uh, uh, well, whatever they are that are part of the same package you're using for the, for the phase diagram um, calculations. Now, um, particularly in the sort of thermocart context, um, this requires calculation, calculation of your mineral analysis that, so that they are compatible with that particular set of solution models. And they put forward this concept of an ideal analysis, which involves finding a mineral analysis or adapting your one that, so that it has the exact stoichiometry according to that particular solution model, and if required, an appropriate estimate of uh, ferric iron from total iron and yet is as close as possible to that natural mineral analysis that you, that you had in the first place. Now, we'll examine some of the consequences of that later. Sometimes it's uh, good and easy to do that, and sometimes it can raise issues. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we want to use phase diagrams for thermobarometry, so we'll pursue that for a while now. Um, and we have the options of matching the assemblage field or matching mineral composition isopleths or matching modal proportions. And we might want to do all of those. Um, they're all interrelated in some way. And um, uh, as, as Frank Spear pointed out, they're all linked by the interrelationships between pressure and temperature and um, mineral composition. And M is the mass balance constraints that are conferred once you've uh, 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 actually set a particular bulk composition for the system. Um, 
But in that, and I'll come back to this uh, just in summary at the end as well, just to make sure that we're comfortable with it. There's a sort of hierarchy of dependencies because the mineral composition isopress, although there are these interde uh, interdependencies, the mineral composition isopress depend rather more on the fundamental end member equ equilibria that um, exist uh, for the relevant assemblage. So um, they're, they're rather more closely tied to the, to, to the data set than to the bulk composition. So our mineral mode contours uh, um, depend on the equilibria and they also depend on that bulk composition constraint. And so that's bringing its own set of, uh, uh, of uncertainties with it. The assemblage field boundaries depend on the equilibria and on the bulk composition constraints. And we'll also see that they also have a dependence on those you know, potentially quite subtle free energy differences between adjacent assemblages on either side of the boundary. Um, oh, that uh, diagram on the right, by the way, is just a, a sample of mine, actually one from my, uh, one from my thesis that uh, I think I actually showed it before with a lot of uh, isopless for mineral composition and modal proportion that all seem to you know, fit quite snugly into that diagram, which was very comforting because the temperature and pressure of that are you know, within a couple of tens of degrees and uh, a kilobar, half a kilobar or so from what I wrote in my 1976 thesis. The only catch in there is one that we will have to come across later, which is that um, uh, if we're strict this, which is a kyanite schist, in principle, it's assemblage where that full assemblage is stable is just that tiny little sliver before we get into the kyanite field here. Um, I don't think we need to worry too much about that. And Dave Patterson uh, uh, tomorrow will have some reasons why also that perhaps we shouldn't worry about that too much. <clears throat> okay, moving on. So we'll explore the effect of these factors in different classes of uncertainty. Um, we'll use Thermocart because uh, Thermocart gives us the possibility to uh, estimate these from within the program. A little bit more tricky to do it uh, in other packages. Um, so, uh, uh, here are some standard deviations on curves and points that we might, might want to calculate. And so broadly speaking, these are data set uncertainties. So obviously there's a contribution from the solution models in here as well. If you want to see these in Thermocalc, um, then you set this script called calc SDNLE um, and you say yes. Um, and calc SDNLE means simply calculate the standard deviations that result from the nonlinear equation solution. And um, uh, these are uh, these standard deviations are evidently one standard deviation. Um, we've kind of got used to that sort of uh, um, uh, that, if you like, uh, less uh, um, less 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 tight uh, version of presenting uncertainties on uh, phase diagrams. I think otherwise we'd all go home a little disappointed. Um, but you'll see there are quite big differences between the types of uh, feature you might want to plot. Composition isopless, that grossular one there for uh, for garnet is is really is really quite precise indeed. There's a plus or minus three um, degrees Celsius um, uh, standard deviation on that one. Uh, modes uh, a bit more fuzzy. This one here for half a percent um, garnet in this particular bit of the um, uh, um, uh, garnet zone um, assemblage here has got an uncertainty between seven and uh, ten Celsius, depending where you uh, depending where you measure it. Uh, assembled field boundaries can be fuzzier still, and so the uncertainty on this garnet in for the, this particular calculation is between 12 and 20 Celsius, uh, depending on again exactly where you uh, exactly where you measure it. So this is um, for um, these were calculated for data set 6.2, uh, and uh, for an assemblage which is just above the garnet isograded biotite chloride pressure closed muscovite and quartz, and we'll use that same assemblage to illustrate one or two other things. Um, so this is the same rock, in fact, <clears throat> um, a Himalayan uh, schist, uh, again calculated with data set 6.2 and the uh, latest um, uh, solution models in the full chemical system um, with titanium and uh, ferrokyan. <clears throat> and so this shows some uncertainty bands on quite a lot of, you know, quite a few of the uh, uh, assemblage boundaries in here. Not all of them, it would have been a mess if I tried that. And you can see that the uncertainty on our garnet in line is pretty much the same all the way up the diagram. I've fitted some um, sort of hand-drawn um, ellipses that, it, that, that are designed to pretty much fit the um, <coughs> uncertainties and the correlation between them 
uh, for the different bands that intersect at, uh, at one of these um, uh, phase diagram invariant um, intersections. <clears throat> now, um, they're, they're pretty big, and in some places they do overlap, but I think we have to remember that the uncertainties on these are tied to the data set, and so they're not independent. And uh, just uh, whether um, you've got a couple of ellipses overlap here, it does not imply that the topology of that diagram is going to flip if we change the uncertainties, because um, the, the, the positions of these curves and bands will kind of move in some sort of, you know, concert across the, uh, across the diagram rather than um, varying entirely randomly. Uh, so that's um, <clears throat> variation in uncertainty on assemblage boundaries, but uh, <clears throat> perhaps uh, we need to dig a little deeper to, to, uh, to, to see what explains that wide variation. So what I've done here is to, um, to, to take it that the sensitivity of these boundaries is related to these differences in bulk free energy between um, adjacent assemblages and a higher variance assemblage as opposed to one with an extra phase, and so we can look at uh, what the uh, what the um, uh, system free energy is with the with that extra three uh, three phase with that, with that extra phase, and compare it with for the lower, with the higher variance assemblage. And that's what I've done here for three of the potential isograds that we might cross with four kilobars on this diagram. Left hand one is for epidote, so this is epidote decreasing and disappearing at um, uh, uh, an assemblage um, field boundary that would appear. And here at that temperature. Um, and the scale of all these three diagrams, I, I, I should point out, is the same. So we're comparing like with like here. Um, this is garnet in the middle here. Um, and you'll see that there's a very, very shallow difference, very small difference uh, over that same temperature range um, for the garnet present assemblage compared with the garnet absent assemblage at each, uh, um, at each temperature at four kilobars. Um, whereas for storolite, again, we come into a situation where um, that uh, that um, that free energy deviates relatively rapidly after we've crossed the uh, the, the reaction here. But this reaction also includes the little interval where chloride is still stable, and then chloride runs out as we build storolite. And the reason garnet's behaving like that, um, I guess, has got a lot to do with the fact that this is a continuous reaction. It's performing. It is forming a very small amount of the product, and you'll see that's an order of magnitude much more sensitive in energy terms. Um, uh, potentially than the other two. Um, Dave Patterson's going to be talking tomorrow about reaction affinity, and so there's a rather similar concept in here. In fact, if you want to turn these uh, diagrams into ones that look like uh, Dave's affinity diagrams, all you have to do is flip them upside down. Um, okay, now I'm going to take the same uh, example and, and look at some variation of modal proportions. Um, and uh, so this is a little controlled experiment. This is our garnet zone rock with um, fixed mineral compositions, but uncertainty over the modal proportions of some of the key phases, garnet, biotite, and plagioclase. And um, so uh, if you calculate the pressure temperature on this uh, um, with the initial bulk composition, or indeed any of these um, tweaked bulk compositions, um, it's at um, uh, four kilobars and 540. So it's that there. That just sits on the edge of this field as initially calculated. Um, this assemblage has got a variance of five, uh, so uh, so for this PT and the assemblage, we've actually got three spare degrees of freedom to play with if we want to. Um, and uh, so what I've done here is uh, um, first double the amount of garnet, and so that uh, enlarges our stability field down to the red curve here. That's lowered by about 25 Celsius. Um, if you double the amount of biotite, that uh, reduces the uh, um, uh, that stability field of the um, garnet first garnet bearing assemblage to follow that brownish curve there, um, reduces it by you know, five to 10 degrees. If you halve the amount of plagioclase, and I halved it because there's quite a lot there already, um, you find that that has an absolutely minimal effect on the um, garnet in line. Um, surprisingly, perhaps it has a, also a rather minimal effect on the epidotin and also on the uh, margaritin. Um, you wouldn't expect it to have much effect on storolite in. Um, so uh, the, the effect of these is, is rather different from, um, for, you know, from mode to mode, but we need to be aware that it can be large for some. Net effect of all three simultaneously is that green curve there. You see it enlarges the stability field slightly. Um, 
So I calculated PT, but it, you know, it shouldn't worry us too much that it lies on or in fact, you know, just slightly over that boundary where we might expect Mog, right? Um, just recall that boundary had a pretty large data set uncertainty on the previous diagram. Um, so, okay, that picks up from the earlier slide and uh, the question is, okay, but well, how should phase diagrams be best used for thermobarometry? And uh, to a certain extent that depends on what we're trying to achieve. And because we assumed that we were interested in thermobarometry itself, getting P's and T's, then my argument would be um, that probably your best bet is to look um, at mineral composition isoplets, uh, and certainly if they fall in the field of the observed assemblage. Um, it's interesting that Eleanor Green and Roger Powell are now looking at a method for optimizing all the isoplet intersections. So in other words, adding a role for bulk composition control and the mode isoplets. And uh, the idea being that uh, you can best fit all of those and uh, they will fall in the correct assemblage uh, field and, and give you um, I, I give you a result. There's, of course, no guarantee that result will be any better in terms of precision um, uh, than um, we would get um, simply using the uh, simply using the mineral compositions on their own. But it might be more comforting to see all that uh, uh, arriving in one place. Um, if, however, your uh, whole business is to refine the data sets and models, you know, how accurate is the diagram we're using? Can it be improved? Then you can certainly argue that getting the phase boundaries in in the right place is going to be best, um, provided that the fundamental data are already optimized to give the phase compositions that you are expecting within valid uncertainty limits. And the catch error is that if our underlying data set and solution models do contain systematic errors, then fitting the phase boundaries is necessarily going to introduce compensating errors, and that's going to affect both the phase compositions and the modal proportions, even if you've think you've put the boundaries in the correct place. <clears throat> okay, previous slides explored general principles and within data set uncertainty, but um, um, this, this slide is going to show us some of the differences that you might get when using different data sets. We'll use Garnet, it's new, a useful example, um, because we might want to use it a lot. You know, an awful lot of our thermobarometry and PT path investigation depends on using the composition record in Garnet. Um, so the four diagrams here, the red fields on them show the extent of garnet stability for different combinations of data set and um, minor differences in bulk composition. You'll see that we're dealing with one rock here, two bulk compositions which differ only in the amount of garnet, either one volume percent or two volume percent, um, and three data sets. And we're looking at what we think would be um, the field just above the garnet isograd. So this is, gar this is garnet's own assemblages. Um, we've already noted that the garnet isograd is sensitive to behavior of the um, you know, solution model and, uh, and uh, uh, in, in a particular data set. Um, but you can see here that it's, um, uh, it seems to be extremely sensitive to the data set as well. In the top row here, we've got um, um, uh, Holland and Powell is at 6.2 with the uh, uh, 2014 metapelite uh, models, and that's got garnet everywhere. And in fact, the garnet inline is 100 degrees or so lower than. Um, than where it is on, on this diagram. Um, data set 5.5 with the older models, 2005 model gives us garnet field to here. 2007 uh, revised model we shouldn't really be using because it's, um, it's, it's intended for higher temperatures. It restricts the garnet in field even more. But so we don't worry about that. Um, difference between 1% and 2% is shown here. It enlarges the uh, stability field, but it doesn't change the um, positions of composition isoplasts very much, um, if at all. Um, <clears throat> this here is a Berman-based um, uh, database. This is SPAC 14. Um, um, so uh, this is a, a data set uh, so based on Berman with rather simpler um, activity models. Again, the distribution of garnet bearing fields is pretty different among all, all four of these. And so that's something we do need to be aware of that's, um, um, that's, a, uh, that's uh, a data set dependent. Also, I put on here some composition isoplasts to see whether they match up or not, not particularly well for data, data set 6.2 and, and these models. Um, it seems bang on, although just outside the um, uh, field of stability. Um, for data set 5.5 here. And if you increase the amount of garnet, you still find you get a very good intersection here. Um, it's not so good and in a slightly different place here, but if, if um, for example, you 
look at the positions of particular isoplasts, mode isoplasts, like uh, our grossular one here, you'll see it's in pretty much exactly the same position, um, no matter which data set, um, uh, no matter which data set you use. Um, okay, the fields may be different, but the, uh, the grossular isopleth. And to a reasonable degree also, the pyro of isopleth, the green one here, um, is also essentially in the same pla place in, in virtually all the diagrams. Um, so that's again a justification for what I was recently saying. So there's uh, there's the point there. Um, that wide zone, that low temperature, that seems to be very alarming in here. Um, uh, it's obviously sensitive to the behavior of the solution model, but again, do we need to worry about it? It's not always seen in practice, and there could be various explanations here outside the scope of this slide um, that mean that perhaps we don't need to worry too much. Uh, about that, just model what you see. Um, our isopleth for spessartine doesn't always fit very well. Um, the catch with spessartine is, of course, it's manganese. There's not very much manganese in the bulk composition, and most of it's going to go into the garnet. So it is actually also rather sensitive to the am amount of garnet relative to the um, uh, essentially the volume of the other manganese reservoirs in the rock. Um, and uh, okay, we've made that point already. Okay, this next slide, it's um, um, uh, an example of uh, data uncertainty versus sampling uncertainty, which we're going to talk about just now. And it's from the uh, Hussack Schist in Western uh, um, Massachusetts, which was the master's project by Anna Bidgood here. Um, and this diagram on the left is very much like the um, data set uncertainty diagram we looked at earlier. There's a nice, thin, very small uncertainty on storolite in somewhat broader one for, <clears throat> for um, epidote out. Um, one of the uh, sort of, uh, uh, of the uh, sort of precision that we're getting used to now for garnet at Unisagrad. <clears throat> this again was calculated with um, data set 6.2, I should say. And then this rather larger one for the um, uh, rather more precious sensitive value here, which is for clotoid in. And so, um, the right-hand diagram, when we get to it in a moment, is uh, focusing on this field here, which has garnet, fragonite, chloritoid, chlorite, epidote, and biotite, along with muscovite and quartz. And uh, if we look now at three thin sections cut from the same sample, we'll find that that particular stability field there um, gives us three very different results, and the displacement of those in PT space is distinctly larger than that um, uh, data set uncertainty um, that we would have estimated uh, for the left hand diagram. So um, that illustrates the possible error or uncertainty associated with inhomogeneity at the sampling scale. I've called it random error then, and some of it might well be random error from modal analysis, but it's it's a bit more than that. It's not really as quantifiable as a random error would be. And uh, <clears throat> exploring that in a lot more detail um, was this um, paper by um, Paley and et al. <laughs> and uh, uh, <clears throat> with geological uncertainty in the title. And this is looking at um, a heterogeneous sample. And, and in, in this particular case, this was a rock that had pretty large porphyroblasts in it. Um, and the proportions of minerals are therefore highly variable on the thin section scale. And so um, in particular, if you wanted to um, make a, a pseudo section uh, or a calculated phase diagram, from a uh, single thin section's worth of material, um, then um, there were uh, there are undeniably large uncertainties in the uh, modal proportions. And the uh, top right diagram um, here shows the effect on the principal assemblage boundaries um, in the phase diagram. Uh, that's um, that's sort of one to eight kilobars uh, on that vertical axis, and four fifty to eight fifty. Celsius on, on the bottom axis there. And you can see the gray areas show just how much uncertainty there is on, on uh, some of those uh, boundaries uh, from um, a, a Monte Carlo perturbation of the modal proportions of the minerals. And that's only plus or minus 20%. And uh, when we look at the real variation in modal proportions in, uh, in, in this particular rock, we'll see that they can vary by considerably more than that. Um, you'll see that for biotite, the, that that um, Biotite modal isopleth can vary over quite a number of fields, and also it should be evident from that that uh, you, you know, you're not getting a normal distribution out of that arrangement of, of isopleths. 
for garnet and for cordurite they're a little bit more um, localized. So um, uh, yep that just makes that point. Um, next slide then um, is the uh, experiment where they took seven different thin sections calculated in, uh, calculated uh, um, uh, phase diagrams for all of them and four of them presented here. Um, each has very different uh, mineral proportions. You may be able to see them in the uh, um, uh, uh, sort of pie charts on the left there. Different bulk compositions on an AFM projection here. Very um, distinctly different looking. Um, uh, in fact, these are the four of the most similar um, uh, uh, fa uh, calculated phase diagrams are on, on the right here. Um, uh, but even so, uh, when you plot your isopleth intersections on there, you will get essentially the same PT result. Uh, and it's around about seven kilobars. It's uh, somewhere, it's in the low 600 so Celsius. And it uh, basically, it, in a sense, that means that if you put um, a bulk composition and a modal proportions analysis into the problem, you can retrieve essentially that same result out again. Um, so that's, that's a little comforting. So okay, to summarize types of uncertainty then in forward modeling we can uh, we can look at this slide um, so we've looked at data set and solution model uncertainty and uh, if we're using thermocult we can actually get a direct estimate of some kind um, of uh, of those the uncertainties on isopleths of different kinds and on assemblage boundaries um, <clears throat> For sampling uncertainty, that's uh, essentially under user control or lack of control. We've seen it can be large. Um, it may not be as quite as worrying as we think, but that um, rather depends um, on uh, on the particular problem that we're trying to uh, trying to address. Analytical uncertainty in the first place, getting the mineral analyses that we're um, using for our minerals, and also in many cases also to generate the bulk composition. That's again under user control. It's a mix of random systematic uncertainties um, and uh, if we combine the sampling error with our analytical error then that um, you know, gives us the, uh, the, the total uncertainty on our bulk composition to use. And just to remind you again as we've got this hierarchy of uncertainties that affect the PT location of the things we might be wanting to use, the composition isopleths, the modal proportions and the location of the assemblage field boundaries. <clears throat> Right, okay, uh, so now a few slides on uh, thermobrometry by inverse modeling, in other words, average PT. And um, so uh, the uncertainty on these depends on the data set uncertainty, which uh, um, in an average PT is handled uh, exactly as before from the correlated enthalpies in the data set. Um, the analytical uncertainty, now we've recast our natural mineral formula into N members. And uh, uh, as, as I said, if we're using uh, Tim Mullen's program AX, then we will we will have some idea already of what the uncertainties on the calculated activities are. Um, however, within the program and for forward calculation as, uh, as well, um, Thermocalc has a model for how to take the um, uh, mixing parameters, the interaction parameters and the solution model. And on the assumption that they are potentially a controlling factor in what that activity value is anyway, and propagating those through our calculations. <clears throat> and so they do that by treating the uncertainty on the activities of the end members, some uh, graphical representations of how their model works is on the right there, where <clears throat> A or A prime is, a, uh, is an activity. It's uh, normalized to one site. I can maybe explain what that is in a moment um, uh, in a bit more detail. Um, or we can plot that um, normalized activity against the ratio of the uncertainty on that uh, activity to the um, to the normalized activity. So what they've done is they've, because it would be very complicated to uh, to, to make a scheme, a particular scheme for uh, for all um, uh, all these detailed models, they've got a general scheme that reflects the uh, the site that's dominantly responsible for the substitutions that are um, uh, that are uh, that are controlling the activities of the primary end members and the multiplicity of that site. <clears throat> and so that factors in the value and the uncertainty of the relevant solution model interaction para parameters. Um, <clears throat> and that'll give you a value for the standard deviation on the activity. And I say that those functions are in the graphs. 
Um, when you get down to small mole fractions, they're treated that differently. There's a cutoff value, and you can see the cutoff on, on, on that graph there. Um, <clears throat> when the value gets too small, then you want to prevent that um, mole fraction um, uh, uh, from, uh, from giving you an uncertainty that goes to zero when it itself goes towards zero. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and so that's been chosen. There are scaling factors that decide what's appropriate for overall uncertainty um, for calculation from the uh, all factors and from the data set and comparison uncertainty. Um, and uh, we'll see what the effect of that is, uh, what, what the effect of that is later. If you're interested in exactly what's meant by a one site normalized activity, we can take the example of a grossular in garnet, let's say, which has 10% grossular in the garnet. And so that would be a mole fraction of 0.1. But there are three sites in Garnet, so uh, ignoring non-ideality for the moment, we would uh, we would say, well, okay, it's one 0.1 cubed for the activity we're going to plug into the calculation, so that's 0.001. But if you want to normalize that to one site, then we take its cube root, so we're back again to 0.1 as our normalized activity for Gosselin and Garnet. Um, uh, again, we can uh, uh, apply an, an activity coefficient to that if we need to. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so uh, right, let's look at some average PT results and see what the effect of the uh, uncertainty structure is on them. Um, so the dependence of uh, PT and precision um, uh, and, the and also the correlation um, is sort of shown in that diagram on the right there. We've got two groups of samples, um, Himalayan samples from, from a single traverse, but they cover two different grades. And so we've got subsolidus, muscovite bearing, rocks on the left hand side here and um, supersolidus um, migmatitic rocks on the right. <clears throat> so the narrow ellipses in this group are essentially because they're muscovite bearing and it's the, it's the equilibria that you can write with muscovite in that are, uh, that, that, that are better constrained and uh, give us compositions that vary more over a, a relatively narrow uh, area of, uh, uh, of temperature space there. And the shape and position are controlled by also by equilibrium, largely devolatilization equilibrium. On the right hand side, though, we've got larger, broader ellipses. And <clears throat> these are slimonite, K felspars, and magnetic rocks. They've got no muscovite. And it just so happens that the equilibria in here are less precise. <clears throat> Moreover, we've had to assume a water activity in here. I fixed it at 0 0.4. It turns out to be a reasonable value for uh, things in this range. And we've had to do that to uh, to uh, to be sensible about our um, uh, uncertainties um, in these supersolidus rocks. Um, uh, we'll come back to that in, in a moment later, actually, and there's something in best practice that um, bears on that if there's time. Um, if people do assume water activity one for rocks like this, then you'd get temperatures are sort of. Uh, Know, 800, 850, nearly 900, and uh, the, the UK, uh, the, the, they are unreasonable for activity of water of one in presence of um, a partial melt. Um, so if we compare the overall versus the relative uncertainty, we've got some comparisons here. Um, again, here the data set and solution models are the same for all samples. Um, we can estimate and propagate the analytical uncertainty. Any um, uh, Geological uncertainty, sampling uncertainty remains unquantifiable. And so that might account for things where uh, things seem to have gone wrong with this. Um, so we can calculate average PT using just the propagated uncertainty um, on the activities of the end members. <clears throat> um, and that is what we can call relative thermobarometry. So we have overall on the left, relative on the right, first for some of those um, uh, uh, muscovite bearing assemblages and then below for uh, those uh, suprasolidus and magnetite assemblages. Um, in practice, in thermocalc, um, the relative uncertainty you get is calculated from the Ws, from the interaction parameters, but with that smaller scaling factor. So it's not exactly what you would get if you applied literally the uh, uncertainties that you'd calculated, let's say, um, by Tim Holland's estimation of activities um, from your primary. Um, from your primary analytical data. Um, we can look at these um, uh, these ones in a little bit more detail because we might be hoping to actually discriminate um, between the uh, uh, between the pressure estimates we've got, and we almost can with the uh, muscovite bearing ones because these are quite narrow ellipses, um, and these uh, these rocks are one, two, three, and four in structural sequence going up section and lowering pressure. 
And one is uh, distinct from two, two and three are not far off distinct from each other. Again, you know, the size of these ellipses is to a certain extent arbitrary. So it's very hard to be certain whether we have overlap or not. Um, but unfortunately, specimen four throws us back in here. And we kind of know that's wrong because that's a slimonite bearing rock. And so there's evidently some kind of systematic uncertainty involved in that um, that um, is, is just there and we'll have to go and look for where the problem is. Um, here again, we have base to top. And if you're just thinking about thermal gradients going through those best fits, then they're nearly in the right order. You know, um, one, two, three, four, and, or one, two, three, five, and four, or one, three, two, five, and four, they go depending on how you look at that diagram. Um, but um, the uncertainty envelopes all overlap. There is, uh, there is one field that, uh, that could be, uh, could be a, 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 a regular field for all of them. Um, so we, we don't have, uh, uh, there's a bit still bigger ellipses and we don't have that PT correlation that, that we had in the muscovite bearing fields that was helping us be more precise. Um, if we want to do this ourselves, we want to fit our own analyses for multi-equilibrium barometry. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, two ways of doing it. Uh, if we generate our own with um, Tim Holland's AXE program, then um, here's some output from it. We've got our cations, we've got the standard deviation on those cations calculated by the AXE program, and we've got standard deviation on the activities here for biotite, um, <clears throat> and we've got the relative um, magnitude of that uncertainty relative to the activity itself. So lots of information we might want. The method that Tim uses is uh, down here and the solution model that he's using in this particular case is the Powell and Hubbard 1999 American Mineralogist one. <clears throat> if you want to do it in the current way with Thermocalc 3.5, you've got to try and fit your analyses to the um, 2014 um, sol uh, solution model parameters. <clears throat> And um, for biotite, uh, there are five of these. I've highlighted the ones that are potentially important for us to think about. There's one for manganese as well, which I'm uh, ignoring for the moment. Um, this is iron magnesium, iron two plus magnesium ratio in the biotite. Um, this is um, uh, octahedral aluminium in one of the octahedral sites. This is ferric iron in one of the octahedral sites. This is titanium in one of the octahedral sites. There's the full formula broken down into sites. And so these are the numbers we have to supply. And there are further constraints. There are all sites are filled. There are no vacancies. Interlayer, fill, uh, interlayer site is potassium only. Uh, and that means that our octahedral and tetrahedral cations will sum to seven exactly. Uh, titanium is accommodated by uh, deprotonation and oxy substitution. And um, the octahedral aluminium and the octahedral ferric iron are all accommodated by additional aluminium in the tetrahedral site. And the important thing to notice here is that silicon is not directly calculated in the scheme and only the octahedral on aluminium is evaluated. And so we have formulae then, we're at the mercy of for calculating the actual silica content and the tetrahedral aluminium content. And I'm afraid if we do that for a typical biotite and indeed for essentially every biotite I've looked at so far, um, they don't match. And moreover, they can't be optimized in the way that um, uh, Powell and Holland would like to give us an ideal analysis. So that's potentially a problem, we'll need to be aware of it. So we've detected a potential source of systematic error in PT calculations that arise um, from, let's, let's say, unintended consequences of you know, harmless looking solution model assumptions. <clears throat> um, and to the extent that if we look at the input and the output activities in biotite from several samples here, so there's quite a range of different amphibolite gases rocks. And we put in the activities that we've um, fitted to these um, solution model um, in, the, in the current axios. And we do the calculations. Unfortunately, we get bad results. Um, the fit is poor. In fact, what the fit has done is it's the averaging process has done its level best to try and shift those uh, activities we've put in back into something that looks more like the uh, uh, analytical ones that we might have calculated in the first place. And what we'd hope to see is something more like this, which is what you get if you take those Himalayan samples <clears throat> and use the AXE program and see what comes out put in your best fit and there's actually a very good match there. So we'll end our average PT um, by just looking at um, uh, there's situations uh, in which average PT might work best. 
and it'll work best with low variance assemblages because you've got more n members to put into the in, into the calculation but you do need to be aware um, that there's some sort of tension there between including more phases in the hope of getting a well-constrained p2 result um, rather than perhaps carefully considering the state of equilibrium in the rock um, and i put a diagram here that um, illustrates that problem really rather well um, it's a rock which has a, quite a complex history um, and uh, you can work out that history quite well and you know my current um, uh, feeling is that it uh, involves um, a, a pt trajectory um, that has gone it grows followed by other things and ends up in the selenite field and comes down here and yet you can put all those minerals together on the assumption that they are all in equilibrium with each other and get a perfectly valid uncertainty ellipse um, uh, uh, uncertainty you know, uh, with an average PT result there that doesn't overlap with uh, with what you deduce to be the path. In fact, I recalculated this a month or so ago, and uh, my calculation moved even further up pressure, uh, giving an elixir up here somewhere. So that's just something to bear in mind. It shouldn't uh, um, deter us too much, but we do have to be aware that um, uh, just because we get a good result doesn't necessarily mean that we put all the right things uh, into the pot in terms of mineral compositions. Um, uh, far last um, point we might want to make is um, uh, again this distinction between um, overall versus relative uncertainty and our prior priorities there in thermogrammetry might again depend in, on um, what our uh, what our you know fundamental um, uh, hopes and hopes are for for the exercise. Uh, do we want to know the, the depth in the crust or the thermal gradient for a particular rock or set of rocks? And for that, we'll need absolute PT constraints. So we'll want accuracy as well as precision. Um, if we're just interested in the relative position or temperature difference um, between two or more samples, position in a section or, um, or, or, or temperature difference between a couple of samples, we certainly need the precision, but we don't necessarily need the accuracy of those um, P's and T's. And if we're using the same set of equilibria, then the data set is of this can be largely eliminated. Um, okay, that's taken quite a long time, so it looks like I'm going to run into the Q&A a little bit, um, just to, I'll, I'll, I'll try and finish off with the, um, with the best practices as efficiently as possible. I still have to apologize for some things that um, people might have wanted me to consider, but I haven't, there are particularly high pressure systems that you know, I am also interested in, the whole series of Eclogite facies rocks, which had um, uh, problems and uh, in, including you know, some quite large high variance fields and so on, little compositional variation and perhaps some um, uh, variations on our uncertainty uh, uh, uncertainty questions that might have been interesting to uh, uh, to look at. Um, but uh, we can try that another time. So best practices are really just sort of one slide each for a, a few topics here. I'll make a few points. Uh, quite a lot of these will reappear in the topics to be dealt with in in subsequent talks, both today and on Friday. So um, choice of chemical system is one of them. Um, uh, there's, so there's some systems in order of complexity here that uh, you know, should we go as the modeling fraternity uh, um, would like to persuade us for the largest relevant system? And I broadly agree with that, um, but sometimes it can be um, more efficient or uh, quicker or sometimes even better to, uh, to use a more restricted system. But I got an example here um, that, uh, that, that's quite an interesting one. It actually arose from recent reviewing work. It's not totally impossible that one or more of the authors are, are watching, so uh, I hope they don't mind me using it. Um, if uh, uh, the, the authors in this case were, um, had a, a phase diagram um, uh, result and an independent pressure uh, result, and, and they were uncertain on which was mo the, the most appropriate pressure estimation to use, but they did note that their rock contained ilmenite, um, but they had calculated in a titanium free system. Um, so I've got two diagrams here for the titanium free and the titanium and the pedoferric iron here as well. So all I did was take their bulk composition, they they'd, uh, obligingly provided the mode of, uh, of ilmenite, <clears throat> and I added FETiO3 to this, and also uh, just for good measure, a tiny bit of Fe2O3 to, to their system recalculated because uppermost in my mind is okay they've got ilmenite but they haven't got rutile and if you calculate this you find that yes you predict rutile to come in at about nine kilobars um, and so the upshot of this is that there's really nothing apparently wrong with their phase diagram calculation and they um, they could be comfortable with what with the calculation that they've done um, 
Bulk composition uncertainty, we have said something about that. Uh, this is just a list here, and it's the list that I, I'm putting the uh, review paper, uh, Orders 219, the, the uh, um, Nepal Himalayan review, um, uh, on, on techniques as well as on the, uh, as well as on the fall. And uh, so that you can use XRF or destructive methods. Um, you can, as some people have done, use XRF on the thin section billet, which is a smaller sample, but you can argue it's a closer approximation to the composition of the probe slide you're using. You can use as many people do, take your own mineral analyses and modal proportions and sum them. Um, <clears throat> Be aware of those, the, these potential solution model constraints like this uh, ideal analysis concept. It applies, sometimes it will work, um, but I've shown one instance where, uh, where unfortunately it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> or you can scan the polished thin section area um, with EDS or probe or micro XRF may take some time, but um, Pierre is going to talk in great detail about um, uh, some of the advantages of doing that and the ways that you can extend it. So that's over to him. Um, just to say that bulk methods can be more problematic to correct for some of these um, uh, 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 disequilibrium or other effects that we might want to take account of. <clears throat> um, another thing that I always uh, try and say is do always check your calculated results. Here are some graphical techniques that uh, we've been using in Oxford. Um, <clears throat> you can use any or all of these or any any method you devise yourself. Basically, what we do is just um, uh, move chunks of output into a spreadsheet program. The RBI matrix that I referred to in, in Thermocalc is very good for giving you a lot of the data that you might want to use to generate diagrams like this. It'll help you see the differences uh, uh, if they exist between what you've calculated and what you put in. What to monitor? Again, we've already covered a lot of this. Uh, I've argued earlier that um, Mineral composition isoplets can well be the best choices in general. Um, you do need to be a bit cautious in high temperature rocks, um, uh, simply because there may be uh, cation redistributions uh, that are changing the composition, but not necessarily changing the modal proportions, um, which um, takes us on to wh whether there's a role for modes and uh, in high temperature rocks may be. Um, uh, they, these could be more useful um, the idea being that it's the net transfer equilibria that change the modal proportions that knock in first, um, while the minerals may carry on exchanging cations, and so perhaps the modal proportions will give you um, a more realistic fix. <clears throat> um, again, always check those um, calculated um, uh, phase composition against what you, what you put in. Um, I, I usually have a, a, a sort of cautionary tale here, aware, beware and be suspicious of apparent low variance assemblages in small fields, so it's the early example, but of course the, what, I, uh, what I used was this very one here. Um, and just ask yourself, what is the probability, particularly if these are assemblages you find over a wide area, what is the probability that these are truly equilibrated assemblages? Um, I plethora intersections for monitoring garnet growth. Well, yes, uh, we often want to do this. Um, this is a figure simplified, again, from something in uh, my Nepal review, which you can read in more detail there. Um, we've got mole fractions, almondine, pyrope, gossula, spessartine, so for compositions, um, uh, what shall we calculate? Will they coincide nicely? And my answer to those which I think are most reliably controlled, controlled by precise equilibria are pyrope and grossula. And I would tend to assign the greatest amount of trust to their intersection. <clears throat> and part of the reason is that um, a lot of their control comes from equilibria in subsystems that are experimentally well constrained. So uh, um, uh, they, they, they could well be giving the right answer. Manganese, spessartine, isopleth may diverge for reasons that I've already mentioned. Um, last word on here is, um, you know, are some bulk compositions better than others? And the answer is yes. And uh, uh, Matt Cohn somewhere has um, uh, highlighted this as well. Um, an average metapelite, a sort of slightly dirty one with sodium and calcium, so you've got calcium minerals to play off against each other is good. Low calcium rocks with no feldspar tend to be problematic. Um, so said when isoplasts don't intersect, uh, um, it could be cation exchange and there may be that good reason. Um, no time really to go into this in any detail, but uh, you just might like to note that um, uh, I chose here um, our best condition is the migmatitic rock. I chose best conditions to be on the solidus with a grossular isopleth here. Um, as our best bet, pyrope is at lower temperature, 
uh, magnesium in biotite is a higher temperature. And if you like, that's the telltale fingerprint of some iron magnesium redistribution between garnet and biotite um, post peak. Um, water contents, um, that scary diagram on the right just um, shows the effect of varying water activity or, or fluid composition. Um, if you're using um, average PT in a, um, a, a, in a not particularly well constrained system, you can leave H2O out and get a generalized result, um, but it will give you this um, uh, extremely uncertain, uh, tend to give you this extremely uncertain result. Um, going back to some of the other things, a lot of this will be uh, covered in, uh, in things to come. Dave, um, Dave Patterson is going to say a, a lot about um, how to treat water and when it's okay to treat it in excess, and he will say that it's basically fine for subsolid systems, so long as you make sure you saturated everything. And I think Doug Tinkham has also made that point already. Um, some of you will have graphitic systems. Um, in metapelites, where there's a lot of devolatilization and particularly dehydration going on, it's often safe just to assume that your system is driven to the, um, the, the maximum um, that uh, it's effectively a buffer, sort of graphite buffer, maximum that you'll get a, a, in a mixed fluid by progressive dehydration and that value will give you something between 0.7 and 0.9, 0.9 at higher temperatures. Um, limits, do you want to calculate H2O content? I will say something more about that uh, on Friday, um, uh, but you can simply sum your hydrous mineral proportions if that's the way you want to do it. You use loss on ignition, but I worry a bit about what actually goes into loss in, on ignition from XRF um, um, procedures, so I'm a bit I'm a bit wary of that. Um, okay, melt bearing systems. This is an example that uh, I will go through in considerable detail on Friday, so come back for that. Um, essentially, the story is there's a way, uh, particularly if you have uh, migmatitic rocks that have preserved a fair amount of hydrous phase, then you can reconstruct the the composition that they probably had at the peak, and use that to look at the peak and maybe part of the subsequent history. You, you've then got a way of um, reconstructing how much melt was probably lost from it um, on assumptions based on how it started melting, put that melt back in and start again with another diagram that will enable you to calculate your, calculate your way forwards from where you think it started to the peak conditions that you've already determined. So more of that on Friday. So just some finishing comments then. Um, First of all, I would say these are general things about um, you know, uh, good practice in, in, in phase diagram construction and thermobarometry. It really is um, pretty much essential to get to know your data sets and solution models, particularly the quirky aspects of them, um, and get to know what the implications are um, in the bulk compositions that you're um, dealing with in terms of the models, uh, the, you know, the systems you're going to use, and the nature of the bulk composition that you're putting in. Second, again, here it is once more, always check the calculated phase uh, compositions against the analyses in the natural sample. Um, try and understand, I mean, there's, it's been quite complex what I've been talking about, but try and understand and evaluate if possible uh, the sources of uncertainty in your data and in your results. So that's analytical imprecision, the data set uncertainty, what's going on in the solution models and any sampling bias that you might have introduced uh, at the beginning of the process on your side. <clears throat> And uh, don't be too hard on the rocks. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, Dave said yesterday the rock, that uh, I, I think that the, the, um, that, uh, the rocks are always right. And uh, yeah, my, my version on this is that, that then they're not, you can't blame them if they don't comply with equilibrium principles. They've got their own job to do. Um, we may be fortunate to find some of the approach homogeneous equilibrium. Um, but of course, departures from equilibrium, as we're going to find out, will tell us much about the evolution of the rock system. And finally, got one or two just very personal recommendations, just for really just for clarity and uniformity in presentation of phase diagrams. And, and uh, one is, um, you know, don't clutter them. Um, you know, generally, you've got some purpose, um, not always, but in, in many cases, you've got some purpose for plotting a particular phase diagram, and some particular part of it is relevant. So make sure that focus is obvious, and you can either remove or fade out irrelevant or distracting detail. Um, the, the, the other one I like to do also is use the conventional abbreviations that in theory we all, we all know for phases and end members. It's Whitney and Evans 2010 currently, that was built on Kretz 1983. And because uh, uh, 
because uh, the um, uh, Holland and Pell data sets, for example, use non-standard ones, and and, that, and I guess that may that's that's true for various uh, um, uh, for various um, uh, 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 well, not packages so much uh, so much because some of them borrow um, the, uh, uh, the the different uh, the, uh, the different data sets. Um, I always capitalize the first letter for minerals, but use lowercase for n members. That was a, um, a that was a, a recommendation that Kretz made, and Whitney and Evans relaxed it. I wish they hadn't. I think it's actually very helpful to distinguish between um, minerals and um, n members and phase components. Great. Uh, I'd like to thank Dave for uh, a topic on, or a, a talk on something that's simultaneously uh, very important, but also it's very difficult. Um, and I'd like to put in a personal plug for a paper that he published in 2019, which is in that um, bibliography there. Uh, it's the second from the bottom. That summarizes a lot of this information that's, that's also contained in this presentation, which is posted on the workshop uh, website. So I think I'll turn things over to uh, Jacob now for the Q&A. Thanks, Dave. And yeah, thanks, Other Dave, for, for a great talk. It is a really important topic and something that I think um, we, people often forget to, until the end when they're doing their calculations. Um, OK, so first question. Um, for PT estimation, you say that the mineral compositions are the most robust and that the mineral assemblage domains are the least robust. Um, but this is the opposite to the metamorphic phase use principle where we use the kind of mineral assemblages as the first thing that we look at in our rocks. Uh, how do you reconcile this? Um, the, 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 the rocks have kind of got, got a right answer embedded in them. Trouble is they don't know what their pressure and temperature is and we have to try and estimate it with the resources at our disposal. Um, and, uh, and I know, and, and so you know, my argument applies that, uh, that, that I still think that the uh, mineral isopleths are, are most robust. Um, but the, you know, we, we kind of need to remember that the mineral facies concept works, um, but it works in terms of the set of mineral assemblages you expect to find in some actually unspecified PT range. Um, and so what, what our modeling is trying to do is locate that PT range as best it can um, where the facies concept does apply. Um, and, uh, and, and so that depends on having you know, really good sets of data and really good uh, uh, controls on, on, on where those assemblage, assemblage boundaries really do lie. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I, I don't really see a conflict there. Um, uh, the onus really is on you know, those of us who are in the position to be able to, you know, to improve those models and, uh, um, and solution models and everything to uh, uh, approach um, uh, a situation where we can find those um, assemblage boundaries in the right place where we need them. And that kind of leads into my next yeah, question. There's, yeah, there's, the, the, there's also the, the, yeah, the, the, there's also um, an uncertainties question in there, which um, you know may may come up separately. Um, that uh, that that you know because the assemblage boundaries are intrinsically less certain in terms of our forward calculation. Um, you know, is is that important? Does it matter if our um, isopleth intersection fall outside the field that we've calculated? Yeah, and that, that was my next question to ask. Okay, so if your isopleth intersection is outside of your stability field, um, where are you possibly going wrong? So is that, yeah, I think you mentioned the, um, the, the models themselves and then the uncertainty on these boundaries is perhaps larger as you showed than on the compositional boundaries. Are they the main two things or are there others you'd want to add? <clears throat> um, yeah, well, as, uh, uh, as some of us know, there are parts of phase diagrams where an awful lot happens um, in, you know, in, in quick succession. Um, and provided those, those boundaries are ones, let's see if I can find something, um, see if I can rack back up here to something which has got... Um, um, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Have, have your diagram to, to show people. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we can look. We can we can look at this one. It's not it's not ideal. Um, but uh, f for example, there are some narrow fields here where things happen in quick succession. Um, uh, Storolite comes in, chlorite goes out, <clears throat> um, and the uncertainties on that we we know are pretty small. Um, 
So if we've got a store like Bering Assemblage, then we would jolly well hope that uh, you know, some of our other isopath intersections are not going to congregate in this field over here, because um, this, this boundary has a small uncertainty and doing so would be, you know, that would be wrong. Um, but uh, while we've got this on, you see, we have got this thing here where we've actually got, you know, some pretty good uh, uh, isopath intersections. Most of them really do fall in this field here. Um, and, and yet we are outside a potentially kyanite bearing field, and it might be some you know, non-equilibrium process that's allowing the kyanite in there with everything else. Um, and uh, then, you know, then, then we shouldn't slag off these isopath intersections from being where they are. You know, that's, that's still a good result. Okay, and, and then a, another question on compositional isoplasts, but this time at the time, I suppose, at higher temperature. I think you said that using the compositional isoplast method may be invalid um, at higher temperatures, and somebody asked why that is, um, or something to that effect, I think you said. I can't quite remember your wording. That one's simply a matter of saying that the composition isoplasts have, uh, have, have been adjusted because there has been change in the mineral compositions. Um, since peak conditions. And sometimes, as I was um, uh, trying to explain here, albeit briefly, um, that's uh, understandable um, because, uh, because of this difference in behavior between uh, net transfer processes and, and um, cation exchange. And uh, so uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, if there's cation exchange, that garnet is going to get um, uh, less pyrope rich. And so it will, uh, when we put the pyrope composition into an isoplast, it will pot at lower temperature. Um, uh, meanwhile, of course, it's um, uh, putting uh, magnesium into the biotite and that biotite will get, uh, will, will end up being more magnesium rich than uh, it would have been at peak. And uh, therefore it pots in the wrong place on the back. Um, and uh, a lot of those kind of situations can be reduced to something as simple as that. Um, <clears throat> if you think you're going to, to be trusting the modes more, then try using the means. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Um, someone else here on compositional iso isoplasts, um, they commonly see people using uh, XMG, so magnesium over iron plus magnesium, uh, in garnet isoplasts combined with a second isoplast from calcium. Um, is this appropriate? Why wouldn't you plot iron and magnesium separately so that you can get a, a PT field um, where the three isoplasts intersect rather than a PT point with just two isoplasts? What, what's your recommendation on that? Well, well that, that's, that's a great question because it really does hinge on something that I was, um, uh, uh, that I was trying to say earlier. Um, and uh, I mean, basically it's convenience. Um, and it, it's probably because the, you know, the, that's easy. That's, those are easy parameters to get out. We, you know, we, we, we calculate magnesium number ourselves all the time. <clears throat> um, and often that will equate to something, you know, perfectly rational in the, in, in the solution model. <clears throat> in the uh, Holden and Powell ones, in, in the XEOS, particularly because they use, um, they use X, which is actually the um, iron magnesium ratio rather than magnesium iron ratio. <clears throat> um, but of course it behaves in the same way. Um, uh, and only even worse because it's a large number <clears throat> which um, can have a numerically quite large uncertainty on it <clears throat> and it actually wraps in the uncertainties of all the other n members as well um, because it's a close sum you know, it's, a, it's a close sum uh, you know, you're calculating these proportions for the close sum total <clears throat> and that's really why I never plot almondine as um, uh, an isopleth because it's a big number which has been um, you know, uh, uh, which has been normalized to, and it's the biggest number in a set of numbers that have been normalized to one. Uh, and uh, uh, and you, if you look at the uncertainty structure of those across a diagram, it varies a lot because it's, in, it's factoring in the uncertainties on, uh, on essentially everything else. Um, so that's why I would say, you know, it probably is best to plot individual iso, uh, you know, isoplasts for, um, Things like grossula and pyrope, which vary, and you see there's quite a, you know, quite a nice big angle between them in many compositions as well. So they'll give quite a good intersection. And that intersection is going to be much less disturbed by all the other things going on um, than, uh, that, than um, you know, the, the other parameters we were talking about. 
Excellent, great. Now, another another great answer, Dave. Um, okay, so uh, coming back to kind of the types of uncertainties here, uh, and you, this one's referring to inverse modeling in thermocalc and AVPT that you talked about quite a lot. Uh, thermocalc, when you use AVPT, provides a plus and minus. And I know you talked about this uncertainty. What does this include um, in the uncertainty? <laughs> you know, and uh, I think we partially asked this question on Monday, but is it possible to independently resolve these different contributors to the uncertainty or the error estimate? Um, you know, example uh, here, how big is the effect on the assumed error of activity? So yeah, um, is it possible to split yeah, this uncertainty yeah. up into different parts? Oh yeah, wouldn't it be nice if that was sort of, you know, served to us on a plate? Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, that the unfortunate answer is that, um, uh, uh, yes, it probably is, but you'd have to do it yourself. Um, you know, that, that there may well be enough information, you know, that you could collect from the way the calculations are done, the way the um, uh, uh, various parameters uh, are estimated, it might allow you, it would probably have to be some kind of Monte, Monte Carlo method that you would um, devise for each one and then combine. Um, uh, I've not really dreamt of doing it. I think that would be you know, an awful lot of work. Uh, um, and, and so, you know, we just kind of have to kind of accept that um, the approximation that uh, ultimately um, is in average PT, which comes from the, uh, comes comes from that factor the uh, that um, you know the, the that Roger Powell and others have decided is a suitable factor <laughs> which takes in uh, they actually quote somewhere it, it allows for the uncertainty on you know um, a typical interaction parameter to be um, something of the order of two kilojoules um, I, I think I think that's roughly what the effect of it would be um, and, uh, and 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 kind of take it from there. And I say, if you want to play Monte Carlo games, then then, then perhaps you know perhaps you can um, you you can illuminate that more. Um, which is why I was quite vague when I was talking about does this ellipse overlap with overlap with that other ellipse? It's uh, it's really quite hard to give a definitive answer on that. Um, but you know, to, just to have any estimate of the relative uncertainty of these uh, different um, different calculations is better than nothing. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, another another question here to do with AVPT. Um, you showed some nice diagrams, I think, with uh, from your from your work in the Himalayas. And this person asking, as the choice of AH2O or XH2O values is critical for AVPT calculations, um, can you comment on the best practices for determining AH2O um, in your calculations? Is it best to uh, you know, uh, change it until you get the best SIG fit, or are there, you know, certain fitting values that should be used in geological settings um, as the two end members, perhaps? Well, yeah, that, that's quite a wide ranging answer uh, in practice. <laughs> um, I, I might try and build something into that, uh, if not into the, you know, the melts presentation, let's say, um, uh, on, on, on Friday. <clears throat> or, or, or address it um, you know, more, more fully at uh, some other stage. But um, uh, if part of your worry about water activity is in a super solidus system, um, then you, know, you could just um, model with a um, you know, with melt in your system and see what happens, um, because that is sorting out internally what an appropriate activity of H two O would be um, by uh, using the melt model. Um, and um, another way is you, know, you, can, uh, you can use um, activity of H2O as, a, um, as an axis in some diagram uh, against temperature or what have you for the different equilibria you're interested in. Um, so that's another way of just seeing what the effect of, uh, of uh, independently varying um, uh, water activity is on, on any system. Um, Using XH2O, well, that's something that um, will involve you if you're dealing with carbonate rocks, but it's, 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 it's also still um, potentially um, uh, important in almost any um, uh, dominantly dehydration uh, system. And that, that even becomes, there's no particular reason why you shouldn't think about XH2O even in migmatites, because if, there is, if there's bits of something else, particularly carbon dioxide, and of course we know that 
Migma types and granulites contain CO2 rich inclusions. I've got CO2 rich in inclusions. Well, I've got in fluid inclusions in, in, in some of my Migma type samples that are evidently um, H2O CO2 um, combined because you, you know you get the double bubble, you get evidence for having H2O and CO2 um, as, uh, as a fluid phase, which is coexisting in your magnetic rock with the, um, with the minerals that are trapping it. Uh, and there's no reason why that shouldn't be the case. And of course, that fluid will then evolve towards more water poor CO2 rich compositions as you go up temperature. Uh, and so in the sense of if, if you're worried about whether to use A or use X, um, there's a sense in which it doesn't really matter because if you use X, then the A will be calculated for you. And if you use A, then you're just use, directly using that parameter. 